I'm going to talk a bit about uh, optimization and the process, or a process for doing it. And uh, like last time, we're going to start with why. Why would why would you optimize? The most important thing is um, there should always be a reason. Don't just go in and 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 find a function and say I want to make this go faster. Um, so I have a need, and um, it's also important when you start out that uh, you say, w when will I be satisfied? I mean, w when is this fast enough? Because the more you optimize, uh, the less readable your code becomes in 99% of the cases, and the less understandable it is afterwards. So always stop when you're satisfied that uh, this, this will be enough. Um, and um, some good good milestones is uh, is usually a, a unit of time, right? Because if you have an operation that takes three seconds, you don't really want that in a UI. Um, if it's just if it's down, get it down to to zero point five seconds and then stop, or something like that. But if it's something that the user must expect that should take a while, um, find the next you know, uh, reasonable steps, like get it down to five minutes. That's how long it takes to go get some coffee, right? Get it down to an hour, which is uh, a bit better. I mean, then um, it's, it's how much does the user miss uh, gain, I mean, um, by your reduction of the runtime. If you if you reduce the runtime from uh, three days to one day, that's that's a big gain. If you reduce it from one and a half day to one day, it's almost no day, no gain, because they they they'll still spend uh, more than a day waiting for the stuff to finish. That's of course not something that you want in an interactive GUI, but. Um, uh, it's important to know that just because you've made things 10% faster, that's not necessarily a benefit to the user. So set your goals to be something that the user will appreciate uh, as, a, as a shorter measure of time. Uh, and um, how do you achieve those gains? Well, uh, one of the things that uh, I actually encountered a bit in university and with some Java coders I've uh, worked with is that uh, the less code you have, the faster it will go. That's just blatantly false. If you've paid attention the last four days, you, you should have noticed that, right? So you don't do it make it faster by, by, by having less code. You do it faster by being smarter. And by being smarter, I mean use use uh, Domain-specific knowledge that will enable you to uh, discard some operations, uh, do common optimization techniques like uh, extracting uh, constants from a loop, which you don't need to evaluate every time, and stuff like that. And um, also, especially when you're using domain-specific knowledge, document what you're doing because the uh, knowledge that is obvious to you won't be to the next guy reading your code and uh, that means that if you write it really smart um, and you don't document why it works but it's that smart then almost nobody will understand how it works. Because you need, I think it's some twice as smart to read code as you need to be to write it, isn't that the saying or something? That's also, yeah? That's also why you should stop when you, you've met your goal, right? Because you can always get, go faster by doing things even smarter, but nobody will understand you. So those are two very, very, well, at least the last part and what I've talked about now are very important when you're doing optimization. 
optimization is not about doing, not strictly about doing things faster. It's about doing things faster in a way which people can understand and still maintain after you've left. At least when you work in a company. It's not the same when you only do a student project, but uh, even when you're the only developer and you come back six months later, I, I'll guarantee you, you'll have problems <coughs> understanding it if you've written it too smart and you haven't commented it. Uh, yeah? I discussed with, with, with uh, someone in the company and he told me that they had uh, always two releases, one with the, the clean code and one with the optimized one. And when they up, uh, update or maintain the code, they start from the well-designed one. <laughs> and then they uh, do a new analysis, a new optimization. Yeah, you'll end up doing lots of redundant work then, but um, I mean, if that works for you, then, then that's fine. Um, I sort of uh, like just stopping at the right level of, uh, of uh, optimization, where you'll still be able to understand it after, when you read the comments, at least, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, still maintain it afterwards. So, what do I mean by smart? I mean using better algorithms? That's where you'll usually see the order of magnitude gains in performance, right? Also more suited data structures, which fits into better algorithms, really. So um, it's one of, the, one of the places where you actually have a better starting point with a formal education than if you've just been coding your entire life by yourself. Because you've been taught what are the speeds of access to this data structure. What are, what are its properties? How much does it cost to remove an element? Stuff like that. So uh, use your big O notations, which you've learned, when, when you optimize and think about them, because they're important. <laughs> and also by avoiding redundancy. And by redundancy, I mean redundant computations, right? There are many ways to, to avoid redundancy. Uh, caching, like <coughs> instructing loop runs and stuff like that, of course. But just don't calculate something twice when you only need to do it once, right? And uh, in, in naive code, which is readable code, <laughs> really, I, I wouldn't call it an, op an optimized because it still has a purpose. It's easy to understand. And when you wrote it, it was the simplest thing that could possibly work. And uh, sometimes, that's not enough. But don't, don't start willingly optimizing that type of code just because you can, like I said at the start. Only do so if you actually have a problem which needs solving. So, where do we start when we optimize? Well, we're in small talk, so we use the tools we have at our disposal. And uh, the tools we have at our disposal are, uh, well, the main ones I like at least, is the Time Profile Browser. Anybody here open the time for profile browser I mean, at some time? Yeah. So the way you use it is you simply give it a block. This is the thing I want to see what takes time when I execute this block. And uh, you can also, if you don't have a block, but if uh, you have no natural entry points in your application. You can simply go to the word menu uh, under the system and you can start profiling. And then run your code from wherever it's, it's, uh, it's a suitable place to start it. And you drag the mouse to the top, uh, actually, to stop, stop profiling. So if you don't know exactly where things are slow, that's, that's a good way to do it. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because it's a new time profile browser. They've um, <laughs> changed a bit over the time, but the basic functionality is the same. And um, there's also, for uh, situations which require it, there's the SPY framework, which is made by Alexandre Bergel, I think his name is pronounced, which is a very, very neat pr framework building uh, runtime program monitors is what he calls them, but basically it's profilers, right? It doesn't mean you need to, to use them to profile for performance. You can use them to profile anything at runtime. But uh, 
the provided ones uh, include some neat ones, like, for example, automatically checking if uh, in a loop does a variable change uh, during this method call. And if it's not, it's, it's usually a good, good idea to... Uh, it can be at least a good spot to, to extract it from a loop or, or cache it somewhere. So I haven't actually used them much, but I've provided the links at the bottom for um, both where it's kept in, in Monticello and uh, the paper he presented at ESUG this year. <laughs> so you can say, actually, I, I would say it's a, it's a glamour for those who know that, but for building profilers instead of building, building browsers. So it's uh, it's a very generic framework which you can usually use to to extract the information you want from from your program, and it also has some uh, nice default tools. So this is what a profile looks like in Faro one point two or thereabouts. Yeah, in Squeak two, I think it's actually a, a proper tree in the new Time Profile browser, so you can expand and uh, collapse the nodes. And, uh, well, the way to read this is um, quite simple. I mean, there's a percentage, which is uh, the percentage of the runtime you've profiled for, which this was spent in this method, right? So under the hoods, it uses the, uh, the uh, what's it called again? Yeah, I can't remember its name at the moment, but uh, it's a polling, uh, uh, it polls, your program every n microseconds, and then uh, saves the entire heap so you can, uh, what's it called again? Yeah. Me uh, message tally, yeah. Yeah. So, that, um, so in the end, you end up with a tally of uh, these were the methods that were active when I, when I polled and checked what was actually running in the process at the time. So, <clears throat> these times are a bit um, uh, funny because you can't, they don't really mean anything if you ask me. <laughs> I mean, wh what you want to look at is the percentage. And uh, in this particular uh, instance, what I've done is simply uh, started profiling the UI and then dragged the window, um, expanded and, and closed it. So this is basically a dimorphic uh, display loop running and where it spends its time. So where do you start when you have this and you want to profile and you want to optimize it? Any suggestions? From this, wh where do you go? You have a very nice tree of where your time is spent, but where do you, where do you start looking for places to optimize? Anyone? In the leaves? In the leaves? Down here? Yeah. That's one way to do it. It's not where we, yeah. So, in the leaves, that's the first option. The, the problem of uh, the, the figure we have here is that we have the cumulative, cumulative values. And we don't have per method value. Yeah, that's true, but uh, still. But anyways, when you start at the leaves, what, what are you really optimizing in the leaves, right? This is a run loop. It's a loop. And the things you optimize in the leaves are exactly the things that will benefit if your code does less in that specific method, right? Not to mention 24% is what is spent here. So the max you can gain by optimizing this, you can make it run twice as fast, and it will still spend only two seconds less doing this, right? So, in my opinion, if you want to see big improvement gains, that's not where you should start. Yeah, so anyone else want to try?
Oops. <laughs> Anyone have a power adapter, by the way? We want the answer. <laughs> yes. the answer. <laughs> Optimize it, please. No. So, anyone else? So, usually the Pareto, Pareto law suggests that we start with the, the part that is uh, 50% of the resources. Well, 80% is too much here since we only have 58, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah. This is where. This is a good place to start. Because. This is the place where, where the loop is actually defined uh, for, for drawing the morphs. Yeah, but uh, something I don't understand. Why is this 100%? I mean. uh, because this, this, this was uh, something I started with uh, start profiling, and then I manually dragged the window back and forth. So a so lot, lot of the time was just spent waiting for me to move my mouse to Waiting for input while I dragged my mouse to be able to, 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 to actually drag the window. And also after releasing the window, I had to move my mouse to the top and stuff like that. So that's one uh, disadvantage of using the simple way of profiling. Um, not all your time will be spent doing what you actually want to profile. But the distribution in the tree will still be valid, right? Because um, the time not spent doing what you want to do is spent doing nothing. And doing nothing doesn't show up on the tree. So this is the morphic display loop, uh, where it gathers uh, all the morphs it has. It checks which ones needs to be updated. And then it tells each of them to draw themselves, right? And. Uh, if you want an order of magnitude improvement, that's where you should start. Because by being smart, it doesn't mean that you should potentially draw a string faster. It means you should avoid drawing strings at all, right? Yes, but uh, then if we cannot apply the, the Pareto law, or at least if I apply Pareto law, I say that uh, for on 60%, six, the 80% of 60% is about 40 Yeah, but, but how did you figure out? How I figured this one out? Because you always want to optimize the loop. And not optimize it by making it faster, by making the leaf nodes go faster, but you want to optimize it by discarding items that you don't need yeah, to iterate the, over. The, the loop star starts at the top. So where yeah, the, loops, the loop starts, that's do one cycle for, right? That's, I mean, that's what's done during one display cycle. Yes, I mean, the, the whole leaf is what is done in one cycle. So then when, what, how did you end up at the, the draw world? Why not display world? Because display world is just this uh, self-draw world submorph in valid areas on and with some parameter. So I mean, uh, display the world parameter here is the same as uh, draw world parameter. And submorphs is the same as submorphs. And the only thing that's added in display world submorphs is the invalid areas. Yes, but my question is that you look into the code of the yeah, you have world to and then you decide. So this means yeah, you have to, you have to uh, look a bit up and down okay, in the tree. You analyze the code and then yeah. you get the basic outline of uh, what each method does in the tree. And then you find the loop, usually. <laughs> And um, like I said, um, the best way to speed it up is to discard items that don't need to be looped over. 
which is one of the first things I did in, in Faro and uh, was recently added in uh, Kuis 3.1 actually, which was the same basic idea. Um, this is drawn top to bottom and um, morphs can be uh, translucent. So you may need to draw the, the morphs below before you draw the ones on top, right? To get a uh, correct display. And uh, the method which checked if you needed to check morphs below didn't work because the default was to always check morphs below instead of never check morphs below. Um, and just changing that and adding uh, the I need I, I actually need the ones below me to be displayed to I think it was 15 classes total in the system there's quite a lot of morphs in the system 15 morphs total and everything still worked and uh, when you have overlapping windows which fully um, overlap each other then it's about 10 times faster so when you when you when you resize a window with five windows below it today it's much faster than it used to be. And unless, of course, you use the fast drag for morphic, because then you never update the morphic display until you, you know the new bounds. <coughs> so, what are some of your tools once you have the place you want to optimize? Well, you need measurements, really. Um, time to run is a very convenient method. All it does is it's on the block, so you encapsulate your code and you tell it time to run, and it will tell you how, how much time it took. So you can, uh, you can basically um, compare those between the original version and your optimized version to see if your idea for what would be faster actually was faster. And... Um, if the thing you were optimizing actually was a leaf node because you couldn't find any good way to to do any of the above things faster or, or, or smarter, then one too many uh, do. Well, I forgot the block at the end here, but um, is is the way to uh, is the best way to perform many uh, iterations of the same code inside the time to run block, because one too many do is optimized in the byte code. So the overhead of looping is is very low. Well, not very low if you have uh, a large many parameter, but uh, it's the lowest one you can get from any method in 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 Faro. So that's the one. Yeah, of course. <coughs> so I mean, you you wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah, so if you want accurate numbers, you do an empty loop as well and just subtract that from, from the time to run. But uh, the whole point of one to many do is to repeat it enough times to actually be able to see uh, a significant difference between runs, right? Because there's many factors that affect how, how fast your code will run. You, you'll have to do many uh, time measurements to be able to say, well, is this statistically significant? I mean, am I better? Am I worse? Am I about the same? And you can't do that if, if the code you're running takes uh, 0 0.1 millisecond, right? So you use the one-to-many loop to, uh, um, the to-do loop to, uh, to check. Yes, there is. One, one to do is is op is uh, optimized by the compiler, so it never does a message send, it never does a block activation. Times repeat does that. In in Faro, in Squeak it doesn't anymore. <laughs> it used to. Um, I'm not sure if Opal has has uh, plans for uh, implementing optimizations like this, but uh, uh, for the time being, with the current compiler. This is the method you should use when you do time measurements of uh, large, large calls of a of a certain pieces of code. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have two two questions. One, a little bit of topic. Do you if it's already uh, integrated in Faro or in the VM? I don't know where to keep the nanoseconds for the time to run. It's already there. It's it's in some VMs. Some VMs. Yeah. 
So uh, it's not in the method accessor for the uh, VM primitive is, is not in Faro. Uh, because sometimes it will fail. And um, some VMs return strange values. So, so it's, not, it's not something I would rely on for profiling, no. I, I would rather do many iterations and then use the millisecond timer. Yeah. Yep. Uh, for example, I remember some threads where they say that there was some method like select, then collect, or something like that, that will also make things go faster. So, uh, me, uh, if there are available or something, some kind of link rules, for example, like that, that we can run, uh, check our code, and checking the code, they can tell us, <laughs> hey, here you can maybe do this or something like that. Because yeah. <sighs> I'm not too keen on that idea, to be honest, because um, you're, when you're optimizing, unless it's really low level, like on the leaf nodes, you, you should never rely on some methods being faster than others, because that changes from VM to VM and, uh, and even version to version of, of, uh, of uh, Faro. So s start by... by um, by uh, checking that your algorithms are sound. And only after you've done that, then, then you move on to doing micro-optimizations like that. Um, because in order, well, collect and select will uh, not create the intermediate collection, right? So you avoid uh, some object allocation, but um, it doesn't work uh, polymorphically on, on all uh, collections the way select and then collect does. So it's not the same, it's not strictly the same same thing, which it should be if you have a selector like that. And uh, that's, I think, the main problem and why it's not been included in, in Faro yet. Or is likely to be included in its current incarnation. <coughs> so, regression testing. That's talking about uh, performance regression testing, which um, is sort of hard. Because you can't just store the numbers from time to run and expect them to make sense later on. If the VM changes, if uh, you change your machine, if someone else runs them, there are too many variables as to how many milliseconds your code will take. So in order to do regression testing, you actually have to store the old version of the method that you optimized. Um, and doing that in a clean way is, uh, <laughs> is another topic, which uh, I'm not going to delve too deeply into. But if you want to do regression testing, keep a copy of the old version of the method. Don't just store the, don't just store the numbers, because uh, it's a bad way to do it. So, yeah, one of the most important things when you optimize is actually having tests of what you're optimizing. That quote is a co-worker of mine. It's one of his favorites because um, I kept on not writing tests before I optimized. And I, uh, I thought I had really big gains and then I realized my results were all wrong. And it's, um, it's really easy to do. And unless you've kept the original version around, well, of course you do that with version control, but um, it can be hard to check. So always validate your results, either by checking that you, prov you, uh, you give the same, same results as the unoptimized version, or by having SUnit tests of covering the method you are, uh, you are uh, optimizing. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, yeah, but I'd actually say that's that's what you should start at when you've identified the method you want to optimize before you start thinking about algorithms and stuff like that. Ensure that the method is tested, because you can't confidently uh, optimize without them. Just like you can't refactor 
kommt so ein Klimaanlage vor. Yep, so, some common techniques. Culling means um, avoiding unnecessary operations, right? It's, uh, that's the definition I use, at least, at the moment. And you also have caching. Uh, culling, it's, um, yeah. You basically don't do stuff for things which don't need it to be done. So it's, you know, uh, not looping over elements which you don't need to loop over, not, not uh, doing, uh, not doing anything for those. And caching is, of course, uh, keeping a computed value until it's invalid. And I must say, I'm uh, just like, yeah, Elliot showed in the VM for the method selectors and stuff. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of caching, actually, to be honest, because the invalidation logic is going to get you in the end. You always think it runs fine, and then there's some case you haven't thought about where the cache should be invalidated, where you don't invalidate it, and all of a sudden you, you, have, uh, you have the wrong results. So if, it tend, if, you, if you need to use caching, then, then have tests for when it should be invalidated. Right? Don't just test that the first time I run this, it's, it's correct. Right? Test that the first time I run this, it's correct. Then do something which should invalidate it, and then run it again, and test that it's still what it should be. Because otherwise, you're gonna get you're gonna get burned by it. And uh, yeah, moving stuff out of loops, avoiding allocation, um, especially because we have a garbage collector, right? Uh, we can't manually free them. So, and. Like Elliot said, the whole code for, for creating a new object is so complex that he, he hasn't actually written machine code for it in COG. So uh, object allocation is at times quite expensive if you do it in the, the inner loop instead of reusing objects, um, which are no longer valid outside. I mean. If you need uh, an array of two, two, two objects and you compute the two objects for each loop, uh, then if you allocate the array inside the loop instead of allocating one array outside and then just putting the two elements into the array before you use it inside the loop, then you'll uh, create a lot of garbage that isn't really necessary. So that's, that's also actually a quite a time saver if, when you optimize leaf nodes. And changing data structures, so that uh, includes running O1 and stuff like that. Yeah, and to avoid that, you can turn into some really nasty stuff. Uh, well, uh, tricky, if you will. You could, for example, uh, create an anonymous class, which is a copy of the class you're, you're, you've, uh, you're using. But uh, instead of using a, a, a closure, you compile uh, the equivalent method on, on the... Uh, on the class, and then change the class of the object to the uh, anonymous, anonymous class. This, of course, only works if you, your, uh, your, your uh, blocks are actually static during the lifetime of an object. But uh, otherwise, you need cache invalidation, which is uh, <laughs> still something that can uh, kill you. Yeah. So let's do some coding. Um, anyone have a 1.3 image? Yeah. So from from the start, we had have a reason to um, to optimize, and um, on uh, the mailing list a time back, there was a message about uh, substrings being 
being slow. So uh, let's open a browser on uh, string substrings, colon. And uh, if I find the correct image. Yeah, one, one very major point that I've actually missed. If you can, use cog, always. Because, I mean, it's so much faster that what seems to be a problem may, not long, may no longer be a problem when you run it in cog, so. It would be nice to get the entire method definition here in one screen. But, uh, can anyone? Hmm? Oh, yeah, good idea. So, dum -dum -dum, separated. Where did I start? Separated. Uh, okay. So this is basically after we've run the time profile browser and we've uh, validated that uh, we can't do anything smart to avoid the loop looping, and this is done in the inner loop. So uh, and it takes a lot of time, so we have to optimize it. Basically, we're jumping straight into what uh, I told you not to do. Uh, <laughs> but as an example of how to optimize it, it still works, right? So. This is unoptimized. Um, yeah. Of course it is. Can't you see that? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So. What do we do to optimize this? Anyone? Just do what everybody does and use the time substring to end it. No, no, no. That's that's bad. It doesn't work for uh, wide strings. <laughs> Uh huh. Yeah. I would tend to agree with you, but first of all, oops, that was implementers. We'll check if there's any tests for it, right? Because this is the method we're going to optimize. We better have tests for it. Don't don't even look at the source. I mean, if you first. If your first reaction isn't, where are the tests, then you're doing it wrong. So, these are the tests for test substring. Are these adequate? Are there any special cases that aren't covered by these tests? It's hard to say, yeah, because, well, it says here at the top what you're supposed to do, right? There's no negative test in here. There's also no tests for what happens if the entire string consists of the separators. What do we return? What do we return if the string we want to separate is empty? We don't know. Those are the kind of cases that is easy to get wrong when you optimize. And you need tests covering all of them before you start. So the first thing to do 
when you want to optimize, think about the special cases of this, of the interface of the method. Well, at least when you do it on this level. I mean, when you do it on a higher level, you probably need to write tests at a more abstract level. But uh, so. Let's assert that, uh, oops. If we do the substring of an empty string, we should get, uh, what should we get? Empty. empty. So, another test, which is uh, AG, 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 AG. And uh, we want this. We want that to be empty, right? could do that. Yeah. Uh, string tests, string tests. I hate this test run. Really. I can't find anything. String tests. Okay, there we go. Yeah, and it seems to be what is currently implemented, right? And in the absence of uh, anything else, that's what we're going to. That's what we have to um, get along with. So now that we have tests, and we we know that we have tests for this method, we um, had the um, answer a bit earlier. So I want to ask you, whoops. We're going to profile it, right? That was a good first step. What happens here? Okay. No? Oh, yeah, it's uh, it's my keyboard, which is. And another thing, actually, before we start writing our uh, the things that we, we want to profile, uh, we could use the senders again, actually, to establish um, what are the usual values that substrings is used for, right? Because the algorithms we, we create will be, uh, in some cases, influenced by that. So that's the domain-specific knowledge that I'm talking about. How, how is this method actually used? And then we optimize for that. So here we have uh, some stream of uh, some random length and a single separator. Here's a single separator. Here's a single separator, right? And if you check most of these, you'll find that um, the parameter of, of delimiters is actually, uh, of the separators, I mean, is actually very low on average. So that helps us write okay tests for, for the performance, which should ideally um, write different tests for different input parameters and check how different implementations render them. But that's too much work for this session, I think. Um, so let's first create a string of a reasonable size. Like that. 
Oops. And then we have the... Now the good thing about this function, as you might see, is that separators is a parameter, which means it's the sender's job to know um, which data structure to use, basically. Do I want my separators in a string? Is that passed? Which it is, if there are a few elements. Do I want an array? Do I want a set? Do I, what do I want to provide them in? Because you can reasonably expect this function to do an includes call, right? So we don't have to care about that in our optimization. Um, because it's, it's one of the ways that the user can, uh, can speed up their programs. <laughs> um, yeah, let's do G, F, like that. No. I don't think so. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. I'm just going to do it this way instead. And then we do string, uh, sub strings, separators. Then we do and the reason I'm allocating outside the block here is that, well, for strings, it doesn't matter, but sometimes um, there's overhead involved in creating the objects which isn't present, really, which isn't part of what you want to profile. So, um, which of course is too small. What do we do? Well, that took approximately two milliseconds. Let's do one, two, three thousand. Do it. Right. That's not much better. Yeah. Let's do 15, just to be sure. Yeah, that's still too, still too small. <laughs> yeah. So, it's a bit better at least. So what do we see here? Um, Well, we see some calls to includes, which is reasonable. We see some string copying. We see some read stream operations at the bottom that will start at the stop. We have next put on the right, right stream. And the reason next put is low is that it uses past end put. Anybody here not familiar with how, how streams grow? So, in the method um, which we have here, you can see it allocates a new write stream on a string. And that string is an empty string. And that's the internal collection of the stream, right? So when you add something to that, to that stream, uh, it will find that the internal collection isn't big enough. So it has to exchange the external connection with something larger. And um, that's what that's what uh, 
shows up on this this grown by uh, in the profile. So it basically means that you haven't pre-allocated uh, your string size to something reasonable. Um, sometimes you can compute it up front exactly how big the string will be of some sub strings. I mean, you can see here that um, it's actually reallocated to a new string. Um, so you actually need to uh, to to uh, to preallocate it two times. Um, but there's no way of knowing exactly how large a substring of a string will be, right? The only thing we know is that it will be smaller than the string. And usually a good good size for things like this is um, when strings grow, w when streams grow, they double the collection size, right? So if you do a string new uh, string size, what was it? No. Self size. Divided by four, for example, then in the worst case, you are doing two grow operations, no matter what the size of the string you are, uh, you are, uh, which is the receiver, right? Because it will grow until the new string is then half the size, and then it will grow until the string is the entire size. So pre-allocating uh, the internal collections of streams is one easy way of getting performance. The uh, the issue is always in, in giving a, a good initial size, right? So let's do blah, blah, plus one. Like that. So now what we do, we just saw that, well, as you can see, it's not much that you gain from this because it's 10% of uh, of the overall runtime. So that's that's the amount you can usually expect if uh, if this is the optimization you're doing, pre-allocating the, the stream sizes. So let's go back to um, to our class side and uh, make a new substring set method because we want to be able to compare it to the initial version, right? So we keep the initial version around while we're optimizing. Afterwards, we just replace it. And then keep the original renamed somewhere if you want to do regression testing. But while we're working with optimization, it's, it's a good idea to, to uh, just create new methods while you're working. Break down, string new. And for uh, quickly checking it, you don't really need a time profile browser, right? You just need time to run. And then you copy the entire thing here. Well, at least I do. And call it with the new method name instead. So, let's see, how much did it help? I just chose the wrong thing, didn't I? Yeah. The nice thing is about, uh, whoops. Oh, that's not good. The good thing about writing it like this is that uh, it's easy to select and then do it both time profile browsers and, and uh, and uh, something that evaluates the time it took to run, right? Because 
on the one hand, you take an argument as a block. On the other hand, you print the time you took. So. Yeah, that's not very much, right? So let's look at the time profile a bit, bit, bit closer. Because you can see this took 4.5 seconds to run. Let's actually subtract the uh, empty block, the empty empty loop to see how, how long that takes to run. So, right? Insignificant. That's insignificant. The four seconds that we see here is actual time spent. It's not time spent in loop overhead. Sometimes you might uh, think that that is the case, but uh, still. So what, what's happening here? Well, when we scroll down a bit, we see a lot of garbage collections, right? It's quite a lot of garbage collections with 76 incremental garbage collections in four seconds. That's not normal. That's thing that happened in, inside your inner loop. So let's look at the method. Where, where do we allocate garbage in this method? Uh, Igor already mentioned it. I'm not sure if you, and we actually already <laughs> looked at it. So. This is the big, big thing where where uh, where you're creating new objects here. So, can we actually reuse the stream we already have? That's the main question here. Can we? Nothing outside depends on. No. So how do we reuse the string? The stream. Reset. Okay, let's do one version with reset. Substring string. And then we do substring streams. Reset. Let's see how fast that will be. And I keep on copying, so. That, that window you saw at the start was uh, after I'd finished doing this, by the way. So. Uh -oh. Let's do the time to run first. Wait happening here Igor what's going on here it's almost takes the same time as the old version even though we're not allocating any strings anymore well This is for the new version, actually. Yeah. Yeah, that's me just ignoring my own advice and uh, doing random optimizations without any input. So it still pays a bit. It's it's one of the things you can do, and uh, the main the main um, topic of this talk is how how do you optimize and. Well, in this case, those optimizations were really small. 
In other cases, they can be quite large. Yeah, that's also a good idea. So, let's look at the, we have a lot of time spent in write stream next to it, in order collection add. Well, we should, since that's what you need, but. Uh, Next put because uh, it's not past the, the, the right limit anymore, right? It doesn't. Times, uh, yeah. Uh, not anymore. We, we just resized it, right? To be a quarter of the, the size of the string. Um, no, not on cog. On cog, the uh, write stream primitives aren't aren't uh, implemented. No, that's the ordered collection. That's the results actually. Oh, you mean precisely the results as well? Yeah. Yeah, let's not bother creating a new method for this one. Uh, so, a reasonable size, uh, self size divided by 10, perhaps? And then, of course, plus one. <coughs> so you don't create something that's not needed. Uh, where's my plus? Where's my plus? Can I have two? No. Maybe I didn't save it. So again, we do a quick check of our uh, current optimization. Did we gain anything at all? It's not statistically significant, really, but uh, if we do a time profile browser on it, then it's still there. Okay. Ta-da! Yeah, so I don't think we can do any more micro-optimizations just to, to improve this, really. Or do you see any obvious ones? Yep, which is what we should have done in the first place, right? <laughs> I just want to show off these techniques as well. Um, <coughs> so let's look at the... Yeah. This is the oldest time profile we have. And we see the streams actually add a lot of overhead using streams here. So is there a way we can rewrite this method to not use streams? Well, we already have result collection, right? And the thing we do is we iterate over the receiver to figure out where the indexes for, uh, for separated characters is. We don't really need the stream for that, do we? We don't even need a temporary um, substring stream because any collection has copy from two. So let's just copy one small method. Okay, we can't, so let's do this one from scratch. 
There's one thing we've forgotten the entire time now. Can anyone tell me that was it? What that is? And I'm kind of pissed. No, nobody has ever listened. Caught turn on to it. Yeah, tests. We've made new method method versions, and we haven't run the tests once. That's just bad. I'm so sorely disappointed. None of you pointed it out before, but. Sure we can. We just make new test method. I mean, we do uh, string. Uh, no, wh where's the actual implementer? <sighs> Substrace, senders, substring. No, that was the other one. <sighs> so let's browse it full. And then do Get the value? No, I don't. Now, I would never recommend anyone to write production tests like this, because they're hard to explore. But when you're when you're uh, when you're uh, optimizing and, and you're using different method implementations, like I am. Then it's uh, a, qu a quick way to to switch between which which uh, which implementation you want to test. So um, please don't shoot me for using perform. Well, this, these, these are just temporary tests, right? When you've finished optimizing and you've gotten a better result, you simply, I mean, delete it again. Because the, the optimized version will be the new implementary that you're testing in already somewhere else in the original test substrings. You know? Because if you get a better result, then you switch it with the current implementation. Testing performance. So yeah. Well, I mean, um, these aren't these aren't performance tests. These are functional tests. And a prerequisite for exchanging the current version with the new version is that the tests still pass. So, so no, yeah. Like oh yeah, yeah. Then we need, yeah, we do, we do need a tool for that. I mean, you can create a regression test package and then place, uh, place the old selector in in a extension category, for, for that regression test package, uh, but, and still have it on on string. I mean. But. Um, Oh, no, 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 not really. Yeah, okay, okay. Does anyone else? Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. Um, does anyone else want to see that now? Or should we just do it, uh, finish it first? Let, uh, well, let's do it. Um, so, let's add a category. It's called uh, regression test strings. Well, that's a bit... Uh, generic perhaps and then we do um, test case subclass what do we want to call it string performance <laughs> so 
let's call it uh, oh what am I doing I can't do this um, sorry stayed up too late last night So we have regression test strings and we place the old substrings in our range. Oh, oh, oh. Where's it go? Oh, <laughs> so um, if I were to write such a tool, then uh, I'd use the method, method programmer here, right? Say this is. Uh, regression method for the selector substrings colon right it's an an annotation of the of the method so it's something you can use to discover uh, methods with a certain uh, tag to them afterwards uh, yeah, well, yeah, sort of. I mean, uh, it's also a vari variation of them is used for FFI, for example, like the 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 uh, the uh, syntax you saw earlier today and stuff like that. No, no, they have the same same programs. Yeah. So I'd uh, I'd tag them so you don't. Uh, um, bind them to a certain category and probably all of a sudden you can't use that type of selectors for real and stuff like that like you do with with the current test browser uh, but the simplest if you wanted to to build a new one on top of that then you'd probably just use the some prefix which it already has capabilities for for finding right and then in the string test we do uh, Well, we don't really need that either. <laughs> All you need to do is define, um, well, it's probably a good idea, yeah. Either you just iterate over all the methods which have the uh, regression test for or something, right? And then you run, uh, and then you then you run the one to something do this and one to something do the current implementation. Um, so a, I guess a programmer would have to I include information like what what are the pro uh, well yeah. So you sort of need a <laughs> need a separate test class, otherwise you end up with uh, unmanageable programs. But uh, did I actually make the Yeah, but it was regression. P Q R. There's no regression. <sighs> yeah. So I haven't actually thought this through. This is just the way I think uh, it should be done if if you want to do it because it's not done at all at all. It's 
um, which is to store the old version of the method, basically. And then run a test, uh, comparing the result to the current implementation. Because you could do that on any platform, and uh, hopefully you would get a result that makes sense, no? Yeah, yeah. Mostly, this would probably be part of a build process, right? You don't want. Yeah, and it's it's. Yeah, no, no, no. I I wouldn't replace it. Yeah, I wouldn't do that either. I would just. We already have a me we already have a method. Uh, selector, right? And it's the selector of uh, the method implementing the program. And it's got the same uh, parameters as, as the, uh, old, the new version. So you just run the two, I mean, the one which I am a regression test for and myself, right? With some parameters that you're, you've defined in a separate test class. That's, yeah, yeah. Like I said, I haven't thought this through, but um, you're, you're Yeah, you can do that, but uh, then, then you end up uh, if you if you're not careful, you end up uh, adding a lot to the change log and stuff like that, the changes file and stuff like that, and that's problems that already exist with the current current uh, test runner. And of course, you do, you you really don't want uh, an ugly extension category uh, in String containing old versions of methods you've uh, you've. Uh, you've optimized in the past. So after you've created this, you shouldn't really run it unless it's, uh, it's some sort of um, build process, which has to check that uh, my performance is still at the level that it used to be or stuff like that. So that's, that explain it to you? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if only I could find the optimized version. Oh, damn it. Um, it's in here somewhere, I'm sure of it. <laughs> um, actually, let's do a test of this string. This is fun. I need to. Anybody good with parallels can tell me why it keeps using 35% of my CPU when I'm not doing anything? It's irritating. Yeah, I know, but still, it same happens with Linux. So. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's getting hot here, so I have to turn it off. I'm sorry. Yeah, we were... Hopefully about to use this one a couple of times, right? So we got um, a fairly large string. We got uh, quite a few separators, actually. And we're not using a set. We're using the string directly. This is higher than it should be, then I know something is wrong. Oh. OK, 
Okay, so you can see my numbers for the old one was. Wait a second. How's that even possible? And this string. Oh, yeah, and quite a lot more iteration. My bad. So we can see, um, I don't know if you noticed, but my original numbers were eight seconds or something like that for, for this test. And that was the old old VM. So, switch to COG. And your problems at least get half as big. <laughs> 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 yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, that's the old one. Then the things are there. So, I don't know if this is. Uh, So this is the version you could write, which I wrote at least, without using write streams. And it looks something like this. It's still an OM algorithm, like the read string algorithm is. Um, OM times M, actually. Um, but it does things a bit faster. There's no stream allocation. There's no copying one element from the from the stream at the time operations. Uh, nothing like that. So what it basically does is it starts by um, doing the same check as was done in the old version. We kept the check. I mean, checks are good. And then we start by detecting if uh, the string contains a separator. If it does not, we simply return the empty array because that was the expected result, right? And this way we, yeah, we don't even have to, uh, we don't even need to allocate an ordered collection for the results if, if we're not getting anything at all. And then, from the start index, which is the index of the first uh, separator, right? We, uh, wait a second. It is? No, it's not. Wait, wait a second. Yeah, there's a bug here. Which is hopefully covered by one of the tests. We should check that. Nope. Or is there? I can't tell, and that's the problem with optimized code. Even if you wrote it the night before, you still have to think about it. Instead of just iterating over every character and adding them together. Um, so the thing I'm not Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, never mind. Because we detect the first one, which is not the separator, right? That's where we want to start. We don't want any elements for if if we start with separators, then then it's okay. If it's only separators, then we also return the empty string. And this also covered covers the case where we have the empty string as the receiver, right? Because 
when we detect something in an empty string, we will never find it. And once we found the start index, we know that um, this is the index where the first um, the first non separator is situated. Yeah, there's still a problem here. But anyways, there, there are some bugs here, but um, this is the basic idea. Uh, we start by finding the first start index, which is uh, where we want to go. Then we iterate until we find the, the, next, uh, the next separator. Then we copy the uh, contents between those two indexes. And then we reset the start to the one we're at now, right? And then we continue down. And then we copy and we reset. We copy and we reset. So we're never doing any kind of streaming over the collection. We're using the fact that the string is, uh, is an indexed uh, collection, right? It's an, uh, something you can... Uh, what's it called again? Uh, it's a sequential collection. Yeah. So it's not a very big game, actually. Not from code. In the standard DM, it's... Uh, it's yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but then again, I mean, the, um, the original version was, was uh, easier to read, at least in my eyes. Because every time you start with indexes, uh, I sort of fade out. which is why there's already a bug in this implementation. Um, so, what was I going to show now? Yes, the watch method. So it's quite a bit faster. Let's uh, look at the time profile browser for this. And we're still spending time, which would indicate that, well, it's not much. But most of this is, uh, is primitives, right? GCs, we have 33 compared to 78. Well, this is a different uh, test, though, so let's run the other one. Uh, well, let's run the same one with, uh, with the original version. Hundred and seventy six compared to fifty seven. So it's a small, small part of the game in this in this case. And how do we optimize this? Well, um, we could make the default uh, result size bigger. I mean, we'd probably get rid of forty milliseconds more. Uh, but is it worth it? I mean. It's 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 already past the time where we should stop thinking about it uh, because we already have uh, something which is about uh, how much is it once I fix the bug at least yeah.
So it's about, yeah, 33% less runtime compared to the original. Um, which I'm, since you're not the user when you're optimizing like this, you, ca you can't tell if that's the goal. So you have to, uh, this is, I mean, when you're doing optimizations on the power core image and you don't really have any users except those who say this is slow, um, you don't know how many times they use substrings. You just know that it's, uh, it's, a, it's a large part of their runtime. So it's sort of the same as when you're uh, optimizing the VM. You, you can't set any, uh, you can't set any uh, uh, definite goals for, for when you're done, uh, uh, when you're done optimizing. But so, the goals you usually set in these cases, at least I do, is code readability, right? When, when have I, or I mean, have I found a faster algorithm? That's the first one. Do I think there is one? Uh, have a, do, do I know, do I just don't know how to program it? Um, then learn how to program it and maybe implement it and check. If, if I don't think there's any faster ways, then do micro optimizations like the ones we just saw uh, with pre-allocation of, uh, of string sizes and stuff like that and not allocating objects and things. things. And the important thing to note is that that was actually, compared to rewriting it without using streams, that was a tiny, tiny fraction of the overall gain. So um, even in micro-optimizations like this, uh, you can't always assume that the algorithm that is already in use is, is optimal. I mean, yeah. So you should always start looking at that instead of doing uh, strange stuff with... Uh, Things that you know will make it go faster, but don't always make it go much faster. Um, probably, but I mean they all have to be ON because you have to check all the elements if, if one of them is the separator, right? And they all have to check all the separators. So the, unless you do some sort of yeah, well you c yeah. You can do a pre-computation of hashes based on, yeah. Do you think you need more separators to compute all than one separator at a time? Or is that usually a number of separators you can pick? No, of course, for, for, for instance, for instance, we could, we could subclass this in, in a byte string and say uh, the separators that you give me uh, exclude all the white characters. Because we know that byte characters can never Byte strings can never include. Yeah, of course. So when you say strings, you mean strings or strings? Yeah. And separators, can you can you make separators for like that? I can do that, but like I said, the separators that that's what I was trying to say earlier. The separators is provided by the user. Yeah, when it's provided by the user, you should leave it up to him to know which data structure to use to pass in. And for, for, the, for the normal sizes of one to two uh, separators, it's just as fast to, to just pass in a normal string as creating a set and then doing a hash lookup. So the point is you can't know if it's faster up front, in a general case, to convert the the uh, delimiters, the separators, to, into a set. So, the nice thing about this method is that it leaves it up to the user, where you actually have that information. So that's why uh, you shouldn't optimize. Uh, look at those kind of optimizations at this, this level, in my in my opinion, at least. Any questions? None? Okay. Well, that's uh, pretty much all I had for today, really.
We have uh, gone through encodings and uh, how to deal with them, hopefully, when you're programming in Faro, when you need to deal with them. And we've gone through uh, a couple of key concepts to keep in mind when you're optimizing. Use your tools. Uh, focus on the areas where you'll have huge gains, which are usually not the leaf nodes. Um, well, unless they're badly implemented like this. Um, and yeah, focus on tests. Make sure you pass them. Thanks for your time.